Hello. Welcome to the Waynesboro, Pennsylvania, Seventh-day Adventist Sabbath morning study of God's Word. And this quarter, we're going to be talking about future hope. And we will start with trying to find out where evil began. Many people have different ideas. Some people think in everybody there's a little good and in everybody there's a little bad. And that evil and good existed together all along. But that is not true. No, it isn't. <laughs> no, it is. So we're going to find out this quarter how it has happened and what is the cure for the evil that is in our world. And our memory text is, now you have fallen from, how you have fallen from heaven, your star, you star uh, of the morning, son of the dawn, you have been cut down to the earth, you who defeated the nations. Isaiah 14, 12. Okay. What are we going to learn about? We're going to be learning about how that evil existed even before this earth was created. Pastor? tension or equality between uh, the strength and weaknesses and so on because they see the world from a dualistic point of view just like we see sky and earth water and fire male and female but from a judeo-christian position evil has never coexisted eternally with good good has always been there from the very most ancient beginning and then Evil show its ugly head, so to speak, and then rebellion came about, and now we are in the midst of a battle between good and evil, which have not come to an end. But we know that the death blow already was executed at the cross. It's only a matter of time. The devil knows that his days are numbered, and soon he will cease to exist. Mm -hmm. At the end, Evil will be eradicated, and good will prevail. Amen. Uh, we're going to start with creation as an expression of love. And in our text there, 1 John 4, 8 and 16, uh, would someone uh, kind of read that for us? Do I hear a volunteer? Uh, 1 John 4, 8 and 16. God is love. So creation was an expression of God's love. Mm -hmm. 
So, when God created, and he created everything, for there was not anything created that he didn't create. So, that is, everything is an expression of God's love. Did you know God that well? To know that he is love, and that he, everything he does is an expression of his love? Okay, let's find out what the basis of love is. Sandy, let's go. what do you think is the basis of love? Basis? If you have a quarterly, yeah. if you don't have one, get one out in the foyer. Because you will greatly enjoy being able to study. What is, what is it there on Monday? The basis for love? We will. And in the garden there, uh, he, uh, God gave free will to Adam and Eve. They, had, they could make a choice. He didn't uh, treat them like robots, you know, or said you could do this or you do that. No, he didn't force it either. But we had free will to be able to willing to love him. But something happened with that free will, too, that we'll find out a little bit later. But that is the basis, being able to make that choice that he gave to us. When you really think about it, if you love someone and you want them to love you back, it has to be free will. Otherwise, it's not love. It's that I feel compelled. I feel like I have to, or this is my duty. But real love is a free will love. And by the same token, when Jesus said that if you follow me, I'll give you freedom, the freedom that is found in God is a free freedom. Do you think the angels in a perfect world had the choice of free will? What do you think? Huh? In a perfect world. Satan had free will. He decided to do what he did. Okay, it's such love as free will that uh, divinely or originated would be the most convincing evidence that God abides in us and that we abide in him. This appeal to reflect God's love to one another makes sense only if addressed to creatures that can choose to agree to it or not. So, God created us with free will. And I think one of the expressions of that free will was when he sent his son to this earth. God exactly. so loved us so much that he was willing to send his son, his only son to us. But in turn, loving us, he wants us to love him back, reciprocate that love to him. Oh, that must be called what we call gratitude. Yes, yes. Appreciation. Mm -hmm. If we love God back, do we, do we know him well enough to appreciate him? Should. We should. All right, uh, let's look at Tuesday's part. Mysterious ingratitude. Let's turn to Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28. Eight, uh, let's see, 12 to 19. Do I have here a volunteer that will read that for us? I'll read it. Son of man, take up your lane of conceal concerning the king of Tyre and say to him, this is what the sovereign Lord said. You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you. 
carnelian, chrysalis, and emerald, topaz, onyx, and jasper, lapis, lazuli, turquoise, beryl, their settings and mountains were made of gold. On the day you were created, they were prepared. You were anointed as a guardian chair, for so I had ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways. From the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. Through your widespread trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God, and I expelled you, guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty, and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. I made a spectacle of you before kings. By your many sins and dishonest trade, you were desecrated your Sanctuary, your sanctuaries, so I made a fire come out from you, and it consumed you, and I reduced you to ashes on the ground. In the sight of all who were watching, all the nations who knew you were appalled at you. You have come to a horrible end and will be no more. Okay. It's talking about who there. It says at the very beginning, the king of... Uh, Cyrus? Well, this prophecy was to be about that king. Well, then all of a sudden in the next verse it says, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Who was in the garden of Eden? Adam. He's talking about Adam and Eve. And Satan. And who else? Satan. Satan. The serpent. Mm -hmm. Or Satan. Or the devil, as you might say. So it switches. Why do you think it switched from the, from the king, uh, an earthly king, of uh, centuries ago to uh, Satan? Why do you think there was a change there? Just showing where his heart lied. His heart was Satan's heart of the things he was doing was of evil. Mm -hmm. The king had the same kind of character that Satan has. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You see? Yes. Using right. this analogy like we use, we can see how prosperous this man was. And he just thought of himself. Well, not what Satan does. He lifts himself up and just thinks of himself. Very selfish man. Mm -hmm. but, well, was Satan perfect to start with? He was, to begin with. To begin with, he was. And in a perfect world, mm -hmm. he was a covering cherub or the covering angel. Mm -hmm. That means he was the highest angel and right next to God. Well, what happened? Pride. Pride? Anything else? In, no. sec, in Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse seven, the scriptures refer and uses the expression "the mystery of iniquity," which in the yeah. New King James is translated as "the mystery of lovelessness." Yeah. And the lovelessness is a connection with the fact that Lucifer was focused on self rather than giving that honor to God. Because the first four commandments of the Ten Commandments focus in our relationship with God. Yes. And, and you see that also as we read this particular passage, is an element, a key element in that nar narrative. It says, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Mm -hmm. So this angel who was created perfect in a way that we not fully understand and the lesson tells us that there is no reason to justify the existence of evil mm -hmm. but it, it was a mystery, something that we don't fully understand 
and all the circumstances and conditions that led to it, but we know that it appeared in this angel named Lucifer. And the other point I want to make is that he took prerogatives that only belong to God. And I remember on one occasion when through my relationship with my spouse, with my wife, early in our marriage, I tried to play the part of the Holy Spirit and bring convictions in my understanding of what she should be doing or she should not be doing. And it was not until the Lord rebuked me my devotional time and told me that I was taking prerogatives that only belong to the Holy Spirit. Love your spouse for what she is. Be caring and loving to her. Leave me, uh, leave my, to me, to bring that conviction to her in my timing, in my own way, not your own way. So okay. I think that even today, we, if we are not careful, we can en end up taking some prerogatives that only belong to God. And we, can, we need to keep that in mind. Now, uh, what do you think, Sandy, really happened there? Besides what the pastor is talking about. You know, I like to just go back a little bit on this. Okay. Uh, to look at him as a, as a covering angel. We go back to Exodus there. And we look to see where he actually came from on earth here. As we look at the earthly sanctuary. He was made perfect. He Him and another angel on each side of the mercy seat. And there, they, they were up high in, in rank next to God there. And we wonder... Why did he slip? And when he slipped, he slipped a long ways. And it tells us here, as I was looking out to, to see some of this uh, knowledge that we can share with him, it says Satan was seeking to shut out men from the knowledge of God. And God uh, to turn their attention from the image, from the temple of God, and to establish his own kingdom. He strived for supremacy and had seemed to be almost whole, wholly successful. It is true that in every generation God had his agencies. Even among the heathen, there were men through whom Christ was working to uplift the people from their sin and degradation. But these men were despised and hated. Many of them suffered a violent death. The dark shadow that Satan had cast over the world grew deeper and deeper. He was known as Lucifer at first, the morning star. But when he started to turn the, turn the angels around in heaven, he became the great deceptor, Satan. Mm -hmm. he, looked upon, he looked upon himself as being beautiful. Right. Why did he begin to look at his own self and to rise, make himself rise up above all the other angels, even above God? Mm -hmm. How can a created being replace his creator? That's almost impossible. In fact, it is impossible. Mm -hmm. When you made a dress, can your dress take the place of you? No. <laughs> and if you build a car, can the car take the place of you? I don't know, Tesla's getting close. No. <laughs> See, so Satan really couldn't. Well, why did he try it? Because he did not appreciate what God did for him. Mm -hmm. He didn't appreciate it. Do you and I appreciate what God has done for us? When we stop appreciating what God has done for us, we're going to go down the same path. It's just as simple as that. All right. It gets me the way he loved him so much that when he noticed that he was starting to turn the other angels... He bore with him a long time to try to lead yes, him to repentance. Did. And I think he bore with him longer than we would ever bear with somebody who is uh, turned against us. He, he, he worked long and hard to, uh, to have uh, that angel come back to him to repent of his sins because he loved him so much. And this is it. He loves us so much. He doesn't want to see any of us slipping, going into repentance. He wants us to come back to him. But we need to be willing to come back to him. He doesn't force us back to him. 
Oh, okay, now let's turn to Isaiah 14, 12 through 15. Do I have another volunteer to read this for me? Isaiah 14, 12 to 15. Go to 15. How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low to the uh, low nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens, I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly, on the utmost height of Mount Zapan. Zapan. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds, I will make myself like the Most High. But you, you are brought down to the realm of the dead, to the depths of the pit. Yeah. So that that we would call pride, wouldn't we? Mm-hmm. There you go. Pride. Yes. Lucifer, as he was, I, you already have indicated correctly that he was a cherub angel and he was at a very high rank among the angels, being there next to the throne of God. From the holy Shekinah, there was, the, there was light, God's glory, emanating for all parts, all around us. That light, that glory, reflected, was being reflected back by the angels who were close to him. Similar to the moon. The moon does not have a light of itself. But it does reflect the light that is coming from the sun. At one point, Lucifer, instead of being focused upon God, he started focusing upon himself. And when he saw the light was, was being bouncing from him, he came to the conclusion that the light was innate and was coming from within, when in reality was just being reflected. And that led him to pride, led him to become arrogant. And, and that's something that we all human race have struggled ever since. Yeah, and the cure for that is Christ coming to this world and dying for our sins mm -hmm. and making it possible for us to uh, live forever. So, uh, when you think about that, how can the cross, as we keep looking at the cross and to Christ, how can that keep us from falling into the same pit that Satan fell in, of being unappreciated, of what God does for us, mm -hmm. and to become proud of what we can do and how we've done it. How can we keep, how does the cross keep us from falling into that kind of a pit? It's what Jesus did for us, not what we did. Mm -hmm. That's part of it. Any other more? Anything else? There is a statement that I'm trying to find in the Desert of Ages that says, I'm going to translate it from the Spanish into English. Okay. And so I'm going to uh, paraphrase it, but it goes like this. Pride and self-sufficiency will, will never flourish in the soul that keeps fresh in his mind the scenes of Calvary. Right. As long as we keep fresh in our mind the sins of Calvary, self and uh, pride and self-sufficiency will not flourish. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When mm -hmm. you come to the foot of the cross, that's where our first saw the light. Exactly. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. There's where we see the light. Mm -hmm. There's where we see. When you came and gave your heart to Jesus for the first time, when you came to the foot of the cross, were you, weren't you willing to do everything that God would tell you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
Sometimes we fail, mm -hmm. maybe a lot of times, but uh, still, it's the idea of being appreciative of what God has done for us. And by keeping our eye on Christ at the cross, that helps us to appreciate what God has done for us. Amen. He gives to us life each day. He gives, he provides for us in every way. He blesses us. Mm -hmm. Hey, without him, we can do nothing. Amen. So why not? Why not appreciate what God does? Mm -hmm. Why not let him change our hearts? Why not let him keep from letting pride in our to our lives? And when we have that kind of self-sacrificing love and self-denying love for God and for our fellow men, hey, if we keep cultivating that, it will. We will live forever. Amen. Okay. I did find a statement, if you let me read it. It said, looking upon the crucified Redeemer, we more fully comprehend the magnitude and meaning of the sacrifice made by the majesty of heaven. The plan of salvation is glorified before us and the thoughts of Calvary awakens living and sacred emotions in our hearts. Praise to God and the Lamb will be in our hearts and our lips for pride and self-worship cannot flourish in the soul that keep fresh in memory the sins of Calvary. This is on pages, page 661. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want to get rid of get a victory over temptation and over the devil as he comes to you and of all the things, terrible things he's trying to bring upon you, all you need to do is mention Jesus. Because the name of Jesus makes Satan so mad he can't take it. He's got to get out. Hey, that sounds easy, doesn't it? Isn't that what Jesus said? Take upon you my yoke and I will bear the burden. Bring to me the burdens that you have. Hey, let's just keep our minds upon Christ. All right, there's one more thing we need to look at as we think about evil, and then we'll go on into other lessons week after week about what we're going to see. And let's uh, turn to Revelation 12. Did you read that chapter? In your studies? Okay, uh, can you see how the spread of unbelief took place in that chapter? What do you think, Sandy? You know, when uh, up in heaven there, Lucifer was, was spreading his lies. You know, follow me. God is lying to you. Come to me, you know, come follow me. You know, he exalted himself even above God. He wanted to be yeah. like God. And so in, we know there are many thousands and thousands of angels up in heaven. I mean, it, you can't really count them, but numerous uh, amounts of angels in heaven. And as he cast his deceiving ways upon them, there was a third of them, a third of them. That's still a big, that's still a lot, yes, that were so enticed by what he had to say. I like to think he never mesmerized them like you see a lot of these uh, pastors in, in some churches do. Mesmerize the, the audience. And I think he mesmerized them and said, come to me. He's telling a lie. I mean, I, I, you know, I don't want to have anything to do with him. You follow me. I'll, I'll show you the right way to go. But he was a great deceiver, remember. Continue from there. 
Unbelief started in heaven. Then it came to the earth, didn't it? They were cast out to the earth. And there's unbelief now in the earth, here. So in heaven, in a perfect world, in a perfect universe, in a, under perfection, Satan began his lies. Do we believe his lies? Do you think God's unjust in some of the things he's done? Like in telling things in the Bible of how he had certain people and nations destroyed? Was God just in doing that? Mm -hmm. You see, Satan said that God was unjust. And just think a little bit. Would Satan say, hey, if you take Richard Hay to heaven, God, the kind of bad person that he's been, you got to take me too. Now, why would God take me and not Satan? Only if I repented and submitted myself mm -hmm. to Christ and let him control my life and my thoughts. Does Satan do that? God says Satan is a liar and there's no truth in him. And is a murderer. Yes, he's a murderer. Yeah. Well, he did not repent. Many times God asked him to repent and submit to what God told him how to live and how to have a happy life. But he wouldn't hear it. So, how about the wicked in these last days? And the lies which Satan said. The first lie he told to a human being was, you won't die. Does he still tell that same lie today? Yeah. Yes, he does. Oh, you ain't going to die. You're going to go to heaven. Or you're going to go to purgatory. Or you're going to go somewhere, <laughs> but you're not going to die. <laughs> same lie. And many of us so-called Christians believe it. Now, unbelief has spread to this earth. Will it spread throughout the universe? What makes you shake your head no? Huh? Why? Because God's going to end it before it spreads throughout all the universe. He's going to show to the heathen who the Lord really is. So, don't you think it, we should uh, make ourselves available to know the truth? Amen. Yes, we should. And the pastor is having some meetings, and hey, why don't we come to those meetings and learn more about the truth? Do we know all that there is to know about God's love? Of course not. Because his thoughts are way above our thoughts. His way of doing things are way above us. I see a hand over here. Norm? You know, you're speaking of that unbelief. You know that to me, I've seen it and so have you. You know how far and widespread thistle seed is. Oh, how it, yeah. How it carries. Do you think this unbelief is more rampant nowadays than what it was years ago? I do. From what I've seen and what I've read and from what I've heard. Okay. What does that, uh, what reaction does that bring in, bring in your life? Do you want to refuse the unbelief and believe God? Hey, it was that kind of ingratitude 
of not appreciating what God's trying to tell us that caused Satan to become self-centered and self-sufficient. And I can save myself. I can live forever. Hey, he didn't get killed in heaven for, for uh, he wasn't destroyed because he called, caused so much uproar. He didn't die during the flood. And when Christ died on the cross, he wasn't destroyed either. And he's still alive. After all those saints, oh boy, I think I can live forever. I'm thinking like Satan would think. Well, we got to realize that this evil that we see in our world is going to come to an end so it doesn't destroy God's perfect universe. Amen. And what do we need to do? Do the exact opposite of what Satan did in heaven. We need to repent. And we need to submit to God's ten uh, principles of how to love. They are called the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. And if you love your neighbor, you're not going to kill him. And if you love your neighbor, you're not going to steal from him. And you're not going to steal his wife either and commit adultery. Can't you see that God's foundation, which is built upon love, his law is the same thing. Love. Amen. So everything that God does is done under His supreme love for us and His created beings. And just think of it how joyful He would be if all His children would love Him and love one another. Amen. It'd be a great it would be where that, remember that sign that carried on the news so much, my life matters? Hey, if you want your life to matter, you got to make it matter by surrendering to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Sandy, you have anything to add to this? Oh, I bet you do. <laughs> There's a lot, but we don't have time. But I'd like to conclude with reciting John 3.15. Uh, yeah, John 3.15. For God so loved this world, he loved this world, that he was willing to send his only begotten son, that whosoever perish shall have everlasting life. We're looking for that time when this world will end. We know it's going to end. Right now, Satan has gone about confusing people, scaring people. Oh, my. I mean, with so much that has happened in this world, people are so scared, so confused. He end all that. But he sent this God, sent his son into this crazy world to seek and to save the lost. We are part of that work, part of that work in helping to seek and save the lost. We are his hands and feet, as I have said many times before. But he doesn't want to see anybody perish. But it will happen. There will be some that will perish. We know that because in the final end, there will be those that are on the side of God and, on the, and those that are on the side of evil. We'll see that at the end. We know that will happen. But he, does, but he loves us with an everlasting love. And we need to remember this that we need to submit our will to him. Because if we don't, we're going to be lost at the very end. Mm -hmm. oh. Desire of Ages, page 22. You'll find this on the last paragraph in your quarterly, uh, in Friday's part. It says, From the beginning God and Christ knew of the apostasy of Satan mm -hmm. and of the fall of man through the deceptive power of the apostate. God did not ordain that sin should exist, but he foresaw its existence and made provision 
to meet the terrible emergency. So great was his love for the world that he uh, coveted to give his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That is God's promise. Let us take him at his word and believe him and follow him, for he will lead us into all life and to a better understanding of the love of God. We don't know it all, and we never will. But as we go through all eternity, we will learn more and more about God's love and his plan of being able to save us. Make a little correction on that scripture. I said, I said 315 is 316. <laughs> yeah, we knew. <laughs> 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 Sandy, we have about one minute. Can you close the prayer? I can. Shall we bow our heads? Our dear loving Heavenly Father, we love you with such an everlasting love. But there is strife among us. There's strife that is all around us in this world. And Lord, we ask for your help. We ask, dear Lord, that thou will have mercy and compassion on your children. There are many out there yet in other places, dear Lord. You have children in other churches, dear Lord, and other uh, that we know that uh, need to know more about you. And we pray, Lord, that thou will help them and uh, bless them. We pray for the meetings that are coming up that will help us understand you better, dear Lord. And we pray that many will come out. As we learn today, dear Lord, that you are an everlasting God who loves us so much. And we pray that... Uh, as uh, the devil goes about devouring who he will to destroy us, dear Lord, we pray we can be strong and stand for you, and that at the very end we stand for what is right, and that we can keep our focus on you and on the cross. Lord, we thank you for your, for your um, coming here, for dying for each and every one of us. You would have come and just died for one person, Lord, but you came for us all to seek and to save this loss of this loss of this planet. May the Lord you go with us now in the service to follow. May you be with the pastor as he brings to us the word from your, from your living word. May you bless, dear Lord, in the words he says, that they come from you, Lord. And through him, dear Lord, we can gain a blessing. For this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.